it's probably most famous for the people who created the Python language there. But in any case, Wouter, there's sort of funny thing coming on the screen there. Is, okay, Wouter, I think you should start your presentation now. It's going to be on the impact of uncertainty on the COVID sim pandemic code. Over to you. That's, uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for organizers for having me here. So I will talk about the uh, uncertainty analysis that we did on the COVID sim code. And this is uh, joint work with quite a number of people, as you can see. And so this slide uh, describes COVID sim. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are actually in epidemiology, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, so, um, yeah, just a, a general overview for those of you who are like me. And so COVID sim, it's an individual based epidemiological code. It was developed at Imperial College in London. And it wasn't actually uh, designed for COVID. It was uh, modified from an earlier version that was used to uh, predict influenza. Uh, but back in March of 2020, it was used to uh, predict the effect of NPIs. Right? And those are non pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, you have to think of things like uh, social distancing, closing schools, stuff like that. Now, what the model does, it creates a network of individuals that is actually based on uh, UK population density data. And within this network, uh, individuals can interact and infect each other in four different place types. Namely the households, schools, uh, sorry, universities and places of work. And I think it is quite an influential model. And as an outsider, from what I could piece together, the the key paper, which is called Report 9, it was at least uh, in part responsible for the change in policy way back in the beginning of the pandemic. If you remember, I think at first there was uh, talk of getting herd immunity, but fairly quickly this was changed to a policy designed to suppress the virus. Now, uh, subsequently the, the model was uh, published online on, on GitHub, and we uh, at the, at the VECMA consortium through Peter, we were asked to perform an uncertainty analysis on behalf of the RAMP team. Now, uh, COVID sim is like virtually all models, I think it is uncertain. And so we distinguish these three different types of uncertainty. And I think the first speaker already touched upon this as well. So there is a aromatic uncertainty, which is, I think, uh, by far the most common type of uncertainty that is studied. And so many models will have a vector of input parameters. And typically, you don't know these very uh, accurately, or there's at least some type of uncertainty about it. Now, this uncertainty will affect the predictions of the output as well. So it will get propagated through your computational model. And the second form is uh, model form uncertainty. It's also called uh, model inadequacy or uh, model error. It's got uh, different terms. Uh, but basically, it is. Uh, related to the, let's say, the mathematical structure of the model. Uh, I usually work with, uh, with fluid simulations, so I have uh, a set of partial differential equations, to, and then I can point to that, uh, to the mathematical assumptions in those equations. Or I guess in the case of COVID sim, as already pointed out by the, by the first speaker, uh, you can think of things like uh, missing uh, missing processes or missing place types. Now, the third type of uncertainty that we uh, uh, distinguish it's what we call scenario uncertainty. And this is basically uh, the, the uncertainty about the scenario on which the model is actually applied. So you can think of bounding conditions, or you can think of initial conditions. In the case of COVID sim, you can think of the set of MPIs that is selected to be simulated. Now, all these three things together uh, will make your QI, quantity of interest Q. Uh, it will make it uncertain. So it's a function of your input parameters, but also of your model and about the, uh, the scenario uh, parameters as well. Uh, we mainly focused on the uh, uncertainty in the input parameters, so in Xi, and a little bit about uh, scenario uncertainty. And to be a bit more precise, we looked at something that we call uh, parametric robustness. Now, robustness is a bit of a ill-defined term, I think, but um, we define it here as uh, a measure of uh, amplification or potentially damping from uncertainty to the input the output. So we have to assume some sort of uh, uh, uncertainty at the input. 
And we do this by specifying a probability density function on the inputs. And so this is P of psi here. Now that will have a certain variance, a certain uncertainty. Uh, it will propagate it through uh, the nonlinear model and you will get some variance at the output. So we can compare those two uh, variants, uh, let's say, the magnitude of those. And then we can say something about the, the amplification or damping of uncertainty. Now this usually involves computing some statistical moments. I'm showing you the mean and variance here, weighted by the, the PDF of the inputs, of course. And this is nothing special, right? It's standard definitions. But what I want to emphasize here is that uh, everything that I'm going to show you, it is conditional on the, on the model, in this case, COVID sim, but also on the application scenario, the, the scenario on which the model is applied. Now, uh, there are two main issues here. The first one is that COVID sim has a, a lot of input parameters. If you count all of them uh, mechanically, you get to 940, although that number is uh, effectively a lot lower, as I will show you. And the second problem is a bit more general. Uh, whenever you have to do, whenever you do this kind of analysis, uh, this propagation of uncertainty from the input to the output, you tend to have to assume an, an input distribution. Now, uh, regarding the, the uh, first problem, uh, the high input space, uh, what we did here is initially we just went through the input files of the code. Right? Many of them are not relevant. Uh, they were internal parameters, or maybe they were related to the vaccination, which wasn't uh, in play yet at the time that we did the study. Some of them are actually vectors, so and we counted every single input uh, as a separate uh, parameter, which you could probably parameterize to reduce the number. So we just went through the input files, uh, cut out what we thought was not relevant, and in this manner we ended up with 60 inputs, which is still rather high. And so we subdivided these inputs into three groups. The first one were intervention parameters. So those were uh, clearly related to the MPIs. And as an example, it's the household compliance with quarantine. So uh, what's the percentage of households that will actually comply with quarantine measures? The second uh, type of input is biological in nature, for instance, the latent period of the disease. And others were clearly related to the, uh, the geographical nature of the model. Now, we did a, a UQ campaign on each group independently. And also show you later, we were able to identify which inputs are actually important. And so after this, these three UQ campaigns, we pulled all the important uh, parameters together. And that was our final UQ campaign. Right? And in, that, in that fashion, we ended up with, with 19 inputs. And for the second problem, the, the specification of your input PDF, uh, we were fortunate because the developers of COVIDSIM actually provided us with uh, uh, minimum maximum values. So we had some idea of, of the range of these inputs. And uh, that still leaves the form of the PDF. Uh, we chose uniform, which is, I would say, a common choice if you don't know uh, much about the problem, uh, which is, uh, in my case, uh, for instance, the household compliance with quarantine. Uh, like I, I'm not an epidemiological expert. And so I find it hard to estimate what the most likely value of that should be. So, and I, I model my, my ignorance with a uniform input PDF. Now, 19 inputs, it is still rather high, I would say. Of course, high is a, is a relative term, but uh, when we were asked to do this study, uh, EasyVVUQ, which is our uh, tool for uncertainty propagation, it had Monte Carlo type methods polynomial chaos and stochastic collocation. And these are not ideal, especially not the last two ones for this high dimensional input space. And so what we did is we implemented a dimension adaptive version of the stochastic collocation sampler. And I'll get back to the dimension adaptivity, but just focusing on the, the stochastic collocation. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, you can just think of it as, a, as creating a polynomial approximation, a surrogate model of your code output. So my code output is Q, Q tilde is my surrogate model. And it's nothing more as a polynomial interpolation of my code outputs. So this Q here is the actual code evaluation. And these A are 
uh, basis functions, for instance, uh, Lagrange interpolation polynomials. Right now, in order to create this expansion, I have to evaluate the code in order to compute these Q terms. And so I have to make some sort of design of experiment or a sampling plan. And in stochastic collocation, this is done uh, using one dimensional uh, quadrature nodes. Uh, so if you look at this cartoon here, it's a 2D example. So the 0, 1, 2, that's the order of the quadrature rule. And so I have two inputs. And in this case, uh, the user has to specify the either the polynomial order of the circuit or the uh, the order of the quadrature rule. So if, if two is selected for both, you get one dimensional quadrature rules of five points. And a stochastic collocation, uh, this is extended to higher dimensions by tensor point. So five times five points, 25 uh, points in this two dimensional spin. I have to evaluate my code at every point and then I can do the uncertainty analysis. Now this is, stochastic collocation has certain advantages. It can converge very quickly under certain conditions, but the computational cost is, is exp exponential right? because of the tensor product. Right? In 2D, this is not an issue, but uh, in, in 19 dimensions, for instance, five to the power 19, it will be way too expensive. And so this is where the dimension adaptive uh, nature comes in. And this, well, the, the curse of dimensionality, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. In this case, it's this uh, exponent, right? It, this doesn't break it, uh, but you can sort of postpone it to higher dimensions by doing this, uh, this uh, algorithm. And the basic idea is that instead of having the user specify uh, the order and then building a single tensor product, you actually build your sampling plan from a linear combination of tensor products. And so you start uh, with just a single sample. So for every input, you select the order zero rule, which places a single sample in the stochastic space. And then you iteratively look ahead in different, what I'm calling candidate directions. So in this cartoon, this 2D cartoon, I can, uh, this candidate directions are the crosses. So I can refine input two, I can refine input one. And then for each candidate direction, I have to compute an error metric and I'll get back to the error metric. But if let's say I have some suitable error metric, uh, I can accept the direction which generated the highest error and ignore the others. Right? And that's what you see in the cartoon, right? I'm refining the second input and I'm refining the second input again. And only afterwards I'm refining the, the first input. Right, in this way, you, you're computing an anisotropic sampling plan where you hopefully are going to ignore a large part of your parameter space and you focus on the, uh, the parameters that, that are influential. Now, uh, in order to compute an error metric, you have different choices. The most common one, I would say, is the hierarchical surplus. And this is nothing more than your, uh, the difference between your actual code output, so Q, and in this case, the, the SC circuit model, Q tilde. Uh, evaluated at uh, new locations in your input space. Uh, you can do this in, in, in uh, higher dimensions, but this, this picture will show you a, a 1D example. And so assume that the blue line is your actual code. The orange one is a uh, my surrogate, my Q tilde. And it's, it's, uh, it's constructed using only a subset. I can compute my candidate directions, for instance, this one here, this one here, here, and over here, and then just compute the difference at every location. Right? And then the highest difference, that's the sampling point that will get accepted. And it doesn't really make sense in 1D, but you can generalize this to higher dimensions and then create uh, something like this, for instance. Uh, what you see here is the uh, adaptation for Kovacin. So horizontal axis is the iteration number. So I'm showing 60 iterations here. Uh, vertical uh, are a number of input parameters that we have. And the colors denote refinement. So uh, iteration zero, as I said, everything is order zero. And then at the first iteration, this input will get refined to first order. And so it's a single color block. So that is uh, refinement along a line in a 19 dimensional space. Right, and then move to the second iteration and the latent period gets refined. 
then this input gets refined in the third iteration and in iteration four you see that two are selected. And so this method is not, it's not one at a time refinement, right? And if two are selected, I'm, I'm refining a two-dimensional plane, right? In a higher dimensional hypercube. And but the main thing here is that even after 60 iterations, uh, it focuses on only seven, right? And so it ignores 12 inputs. And so even though if you have uh, a lot of input parameters, effectively this tends, this number tends to be lower. Right? Then you can, you can kind of on the fly, you can try to find out what that dimension is. Now, the thing to remember here is that it covid sim it's, it's not exactly a cheap model. It uses 28 cores and it, it finishes in about maybe 10, 15 minutes. And so it's not a massive uh, application, but it's still not something you can do on your laptop. And so, as I mentioned, we used easy VVUQ to do the sampling and to submit these jobs to a supercomputer, we used FabSim3, which is one of the VECMA tools. And I think that uh, Derek will explain this uh, in the last day. Right, and then we, we executed each ensemble on the uh, Eagle machine in Poland. Now, these are some results that we got for, for this type of analysis. Uh, confidence intervals for the cumulative deaths, uh, again, conditional on the certain scenario, in this case, a uh, certain R0, and a certain type of uh, uh, switching on and off of the MPI. So the MPIs are either switched on and off based on the number of uh, weekly ICU uh, admissions. Right? So if there's over 60, then the MPIs will be turned on. If it drops below 15, it's going to shut off. Right? But, so these, this is fixed in this analysis. And what's changing is just the, uh, the input parameters. Now you can see the mean, of course, the confidence intervals and the, uh, the final PDF after roughly two years. And you can see it's really a fat tilt distribution. And another thing to notice here is that uh, you can see the yellow line, which is, uh, let's say, a deterministic sample from the original paper for the same, uh, the same scenario. And it's clear that this is a, just a sample from a distribution which can be much wider. And the final thing to note is the, the green dots, that's the actual data. And so we don't capture that with our uncertainty analysis. And I think the main reason here is that we're not taking into account the uncertainty in the, in, in the initial condition. And there's an, another paper by Graham Eklund and he shows that you can actually tune them all to fit the data, but in order to do that, you have to change the initial condition. So uh, parametric uncertainty is not the whole story. Things like a model and scenario uncertainty can also be important. Now, this is the same result, but for a different scenario. You can already see the, the effect, right? It captures the data quite a bit better. And so this just really goes to show you that these results are, are conditional. Uh, we, we don't have to focus on cumulative deaths. This is another quantity of interest, the, uh, the time-dependent reproduction number. Uh, again, confidence intervals 95%. And the orange line is a single sample. So you can really see when the model is switching on and off the, uh, the MPI measures. And I think, I think we mentioned this in the paper, but uh, there is some data to suggest that RT uh, it didn't go below 0 0.7, if I remember well. And so it, it does seem to capture this, this lower bounds pretty well. Wouter, can you hear me now? Yeah. Just yeah. to let you know, you've got five minutes left. Okay. Oh, I think, uh, I think I'll manage. Uh, another thing you can do is a sensitivity analysis. So these are first order solvable indices. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, it's, it's just a number between zero and one. And it measures the, the fraction of the output variance that you can attribute uh, to changing a, a single parameter. And so I have 19, uh, 19 parameters. So I get 19 first order indices. And because my quantity of interest is a function of time, that translates to the sober index. So these are a function of time as well. So you can see that the the blue one, which is the latent period, very important because it's close to one in the beginning, but kind of uh, dies out later. 
And another thing to notice is that many inputs are very close or almost at zero. And this is the same for the, the second scenario that we looked at. The, the values change a bit, but you know, quantitatively the, the results are the same. Uh, there's like three inputs that will cover already 60% of the variance. And that's that's shown by this uh, this line here with the red diamonds. Those are the three most influential parameters added together. So with that, you already, you're already over 60% of the observed variance. Uh, I mentioned the robustness in the beginning, and that this is related to amplification or damping of uncertainty. And so the general question there is, you know, we have this output variance. Is this actually large compared to the amount of uncertainty that we assumed at the inputs? Uh, and Sobel indices, they don't, they don't measure that. Uh, and we couldn't find any measure that actually does this. So we, we tried to develop a new one. And it's based on the ratio of coefficients of variation. So the coefficient of variation is nothing more than a standard deviation divided by the mean. So it's, it's dimensionless and it, it measures the, the variability around the mean value. And we did this for both the output and the input, you know, on average. And so this is average coefficient uh, of variation ratio. That's, that's our measure. And if it's larger than one, we say that there's uh, an amplification of uncertainty and, and vice versa for smaller than one. And then we say that there's damping of uncertainty. Now for Covertim, again, for the same two scenarios we considered, uh, these are the results. Well, the inputs are the same, so this uh, remains constant. And these are the coefficients of variation at the output. And so by dividing these two, we get to uh, an amplification uh, of factors three and two, respectively. And with that, I'm already at the conclusion. Uh, so we, we did this adaptive. UQ campaign and COVID sim, yes, it has a lot of inputs, but not really, uh, because you can bring it down to 19, maybe less. And if you just look at the 19, only three already cover 60% of the variance. Right? This number can change a bit, but I think in, in general, uh, there's just a couple of them that are really important. Uh, I also think it's important to do ensembles over, for instance, the scenarios, maybe possibly models as well. And I added this last minute because I agree with, uh, with the first speaker. It's also uh, uh, good to uh, investigate calibration or, or data assimilation. Now, if you want to read the paper, it's published here and featured in some other, other articles as well. And with that, I'd like to take any questions. Uh, hope you can. Can you hear me still? Yeah, I can. Right. So. Questions from the hall where I am first, if there are any. Cannot see anything coming from here. So, Claire, ah, there is one actually from Danny Williamson. Thank you. That, thanks for a nice talk. Um, wh when you see the picture that you had with the trajectories of your uncertainty analysis and, and missing the data. Yeah. Um, and believe me, I sympathize with this. Um, how, how do you, how would you, what sort of time scale do you think you could advise a policymaker with, with this kind of uncertainty analysis and how near does the data need to be to the shadows uh, before you're willing to show it to them? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm not, no, by no means an expert in, in epidemiology. Uh, it, it seems clear to me that two years is too much of a stretch. And you, you also have something to remember that the, the settings that we show you here uh, are based from March of 2020. So way back in the beginning. And but yeah, how, how far can you predict? Maybe a couple of weeks, I think. I've attended a couple of talks from epidemiologists and I think I remember a couple of weeks. And it's probably also necessary to do some sort of continual tuning, some sort of continual data simulation in order to keep it on track. 
but yeah, maybe a couple weeks, a month, but there might be others who are more knowledgeable than me who can answer that. What's most striking there to me is the uh, highly non-normal nature of the distribution, mm -hmm. quite a fat tail, which is common in the context of climate modeling and so on, which we'll be hearing about a bit later, which means that the expectation value over that will look nowhere near what the mean or the, 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 the sort of um, maybe the, the median or mode that I'm thinking you would, you would it sort of imagine is where you're most likely to get a result. It will be much further over than that. So uh, is there anyone remote to us here asking any questions? Okay, so I think, uh, Jane, we're slightly running over. We're going to have a break. And how long would you like it to be? Right. Okay, so maybe we should just give Walter Edling one final round of applause for his talk and all the other speakers in this session. Thank you.